Well, tonight we're going to be doing, like uh, uh, Jimmy was saying, uh, lesson two, uh, a man, a child of God. And what a, what a wonderful topic that this is. Uh, I learned a lot when I was preparing for it. Uh, but what, what this is going to get, kind of get our heads wrapped around and our hearts wrapped around when we get our, our, our mind wrapped around this is really the structure, the, the, uh, the uh, structure and how we're set up. Um, between who God is and who we are. And looking at that from, a, from, a, from the doctrinal truth as, as, as man being uh, a child of God and what that means and what that looks like. Uh, as you uh, look on your sheet here, we're going to go through uh, six, uh, six sections and we're going to uh, get these one, one at a time. But to kind of get our head wrapped around it first, uh, being man being a child of God, is thinking about it, you know, from from an illustrative point of view, as like a from a business term. Right? A business term, you would have a subsidiary. You know, you, you have like a daughter uh, company. You know, you have your parent company, your holding company. Uh, you have your subsidiary. You know, like you have your um, you have your daughter company, and that and that daughter company uh, is legally and financially controlled by the parent company. Uh, and so everything that that daughter company brings in, there's, there's con contractual terms uh, that are, have that relationship defined uh, where that daughter company uh, is legally and financially controlled by the, by, the, by the parent company. There's other business terms that would dis help describe the relationship uh, between uh, one entity and another entity are things like divisions, uh, associate company, uh, programs, uh, tiers, um, if you're like in a corporate environment like myself, these buzzwords are all, all over the place. Uh, and they're unique, right, to the industries and different things like that where it helps us define what clearly, uh, what the relationship is. And so we see that in the Bible actually, right? We, we uh, see uh, all over the Bible where it's described, where terms are being used uh, to help us understand uh, our, our relationship as human beings with our creator. We talked about last week as man... Uh, being uh, a man being created by, by God. And so this is kind of like that next uh, follow-on to help unpack this and, and to uh, understand this. For one thing, in like a business, there's a joint venture. And that is absolutely not the relationship between man and God. Now, like what is often uh, interpreted as, as we think about that, that God is our co-pilot. Right? And we think about this as this joint venture. And so we have a, a, um, an incorrect, very unbiblical uh, view of our relationship with God. And so on the front of your handout, I want you to write on the top, uh, on the top left, I want you to write the word universal. And on the right side, I want you to write the word particular. And this will kind of help you uh, narrow down some of these categories in our minds as we kind of go through them one at a time, uh, we're going to look at these two broad categories as man as a child of God universally, and we're also going to, uh, going to unpack it in a way, in a way where it, how it means particularly. Universal on the left and particular on the right. So with, um, in, the, in the, maybe in the, and also next to the word universal, you can write the word natural in a natural sense. In a particular, you can write the word spiritual. So section, section one, uh, read, read with me here and, and fill in the blanks. God is the father of all men. God is the father of all men in that he originates them. Fatherhood in this basic sense implies origination. Origination. An impartation of life to mankind. God as Father underlines the history of creation. So God is the God is the Father of all men, in that He originates them. Fatherhood, in this basic sense, implies origination. An impartation of life to mankind. God as Father underlines the history of creation. On the front there, you got the Malachi 2.10. Read that with me here. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? 
Why do we, why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? And to help us understand this relationship, just initially, just off the bat here, I, I really love that phrase, covenant of the fathers. And when we think about what, how God revealed himself throughout the Old Testament was through these covenants. And in Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, it was kind of looking back as the, as the people of Israel were looking at, and they saw their relationship with God by these covenants. And some were conditional, some were unconditional. We're not going to get into, the, into a covenant discussion uh, tonight. Um, but it helped us be able to understand that this was a, a sacred relationship, that this was something that uh, was very precious, that there was like an inner circle uh, between God and his people. Uh, and this uh, originally came uh, to, to all, um, not, with the, not with the covenants, but in this particular one, it was in relationship to the nation of, of, of Israel. And so when we see Israel break these covenants, we see, them do, we, we see them do it in a way where it was very heinous and very vulgar, where they intermarried with other nations and they brought, they brought religious foreign gods into a circumcised group of people. And that was a blatant uh, violation of this relationship that Israel had with, with uh, God. And so that's, that's, that is what describes our relationship as an individual with God when we violate his law. When we violate his law, it's like God sitting there watching while you heinously break his commandments. And it was, uh, we, we kind of we kind of see that happening. It's going back to in business terms, um, it's like if a, the daughter company, uh, in relationship with the parent company, if the daughter company uh, makes an agreement and makes another contractual with another company uh, without the authorization of the parent company. And the parent company is sitting there like, what? You know, so the parent company in this case, or the, uh, the, the rank of authority is, is held uh, without any sort of uh, moral uh, debt or, or uh, compromise of breaking the covenant, uh, but the daughter company or the child or the, uh, the, the, the uh, entity that's underneath is in complete violation of what was originally uh, agreed upon and contractually uh, agreed. And so even still, all men originate from God Therefore, God is the ruling authority over all men. That's a very key thing as we get to this point of uh, where, the, where the fatherhood in the basic sense implies origination. And so in that basic sense, all men originate from God. Uh, therefore, God is, ruling, is the ruling authority over all men. The next verse is in Acts 17. We're going to hit this verse and then a few verses after that later on. But in Acts 17... Is in this part is when Paul is addressing the, the uh, men of Athens. And so he's describing a secular group. And so read with me here as he's uh, in the middle of his address. It says, For in him, this is Acts 17, verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as, as also some of your own poets have said, For we are also his offspring. And if you're looking at it, you know, in context, he actually is referring to all mankind. When he's addressing uh, the men of Athens in the, in the public square there, he is referring to, when it says us, he's referring to all mankind. And the word offspring here in the end of this verse, there's a uh, Greek term um, that, was, that was used here. It's genos, and genos is, is another word for children or uh, a kind or uh, in the terms of a family. And so when we think about that, it's very important to understand that this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, making it very clear about how all mankind is under the offspring of, of God. And so therefore, God is the ruling authority over all, over all men. The next verse on the back, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6 it says, yet for us there is one God, the Father, 
from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. The application for this first section is, how do we, as fathers, witness about God? How do we, as fathers, witness about God? In other words, how do we, when other people see us, how, are, how do people see us as an example of who God is? When people see our, uh, hear our words, when they see our actions, uh, are they learning more about God by just watching you and listening to you and un- understanding you more uh, as you are able to, to proclaim God's word? Uh, are you able to, to make him known uh, by who you are and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, what you say? And so... Many can be spiritual fathers as well. So we've, we've talked about in our spiritual maturity how we, are, uh, we, we grow to be fathers of the faith that all of us can reproduce uh, by making disciples. And so that's, that's in another sense. I know when I was at uh, the pregnancy center uh, a year and a half ago, I was uh, serving there for a couple years, and I would get into um, a little room with a, with a boyfriend uh, maybe even a guy who was uh, with with the with the with the pregnant gal, uh, just to escort her to the center uh, for for uh, whatever reason. And I, I remember being able to uh, get in there and to listen and to be a, be a be a sounding board uh, for this uh, young man who is uh, most likely to be afraid about what's what's next ahead. And so this was um, something that I think as as um, uh, as this, when I was thinking about the, about these men that I would come across, you know, how how are they going to get to know God by what I say or what I do? Just it, it could be like a two minute conversation, it could be an hour conversation. It just you know, I, I don't really don't know uh, when I was serving uh, in that capacity uh, what was going to take place. And I, there are some times where I wanted to kind of. Uh, reach across and to be able to like, you know, pound this in the guy's mind. And I was just like, you know, all your girlfriend or your baby want to hear is for, and for, for you to look at them and to say, you're mine. I love you. That's, that's, like, that's like all they want to, that, that, that's all they want. And so I would want to be able to try to communicate that in a way where this man can go off and now witness to his family and demonstrate the heart of God. The heart of God as we all desire for God to be able to look at us and, and say, you are mine, I love you. And that, that, that's um, something that I think we can uh, always aspire to do better in. We're all fallible creatures. And, and, um, but that's something to kind of help us get started here to be able to understand this relationship between uh, God and, and mankind. It gets uh, very personal really quick. And thankfully, we have a God who is always there. And he is uh, holy and righteous. And we, nobody needs to, like, uh, jumpstart God, right? <laughs> we are totally, like, like we said, like we are the daughter company that has made the agreement with another company. And God's right there uh, observing that. And he will hold us accountable, as we'll get, we'll get into here um, in a little bit. This next section, uh, read with me here in section two. God is the father of all men in that he created them as personal beings. First blank is personal. He created them as personal beings with a likeness, a likeness, in nature to himself. Fatherhood in this natural sense implies a similarity of faculties and powers. God as father underlines the doctrine of humanity. So to kind of help us understand this likeness that we have with God, uh, there's there's two different ways where we can look at uh, our attributes and God's attributes that we've as we've kind of unpacked uh, God's attributes in this theology lesson, we can go back in another series and understand God's attributes. Are the two different types of attributes is communi- communicable 
I've always have trouble saying that. Communicable attributes and incommunicable attributes. Uh, we've said this before is that uh, the word uh, uh, calm or communicable, the word calm is a, like a, comes from a Latin word uh, with or together or jointly. And so the communicable a- attributes are ones that we share with God. These are ones uh, uh, like, a, like we, we uh, share a sense of love, a sense of justice, a sense of, sense of truthfulness, rational thought, and relational. And as we grow to be more like Christ in our sanctification, we show the fruit of the Spirit. However, God is holy and he's set apart. He's, he's other. His nature is, uh, his nature is alien to our spiritual corruption. And so, but we do share these communicable attributes, but they're finite and they're fallible, right? And that's when we get into the kind of lead more into the incommunicable attributes uh, where they are exclusive only to God. They are, he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, infallible, sovereign, self-existent, transcendent, transcendent as, is, as he is over all, all his creation. He is eminent, that he is close by. He is, he is Emmanuel, he is, he, is, he is eminent. He's immutable and he's eternal. So you can see how those uh, are often uh, misunderstood or, or often negated uh, we, 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 we sometimes feel like, yeah, 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 let me just, I want to dwell on these communicable attributes, you know, of God. I want to put God in a box and, and different things. But he is high and lifted up in these incommunicable attributes. We see uh, titles in the Hebrew or in the Old Testament where, he's, where they, they, uh, the Jewish people called God El Shaddai, Adonai, and Yahweh. Read with me in the front uh, here on James chapter 3, verse 9. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. In the NASB, the similitude is, is a, a word likeness. So in um, uh, who have been made in the likeness of God. So the application for this section is we are to be holy, therefore, God, therefore, as God is holy, we are to be holy, therefore, as God is holy. I was going to um, think about leaving out some movie quotes tonight, but I can't help it. This is, I think, the one movie quote I have tonight. It's called a uh, movie, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It's a Stephen King uh, knockoff, what he wrote. It's called The Gunslinger. Um, but there's a, there's a phrase in there that uh, helps us understand uh, this is that the gunslinger says to people that he sees, he, he sees these two girls and they're uh, dressed in scandalous clothes on the subway and he just looks at him and says, you have forgotten the face of your father. You have forgotten the face of your father. And I feel like we as mankind have forgotten what it means to be set apart. We have forgotten what it means to be in the sacred. We have forgotten what it means to be in Christ. And so we go about and we live a life where our back's turned and we have this agreement that is in violation of God's law and we find others that are okay with that and we, we live in, in, in that. There are three different ways. I want to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, they're not on your sheet, but if you have a side piece of paper, you can write them down or whatever, or go back to, into, the, into the video and, and watch these. I got these from Ravi Zacharias. I know Ravi Zacharias, uh, there's, this is probably one of the one, one or two things that I got from him that uh, were good. Uh, the, 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 the truth doesn't change. But these are three different ways where we as men, mankind, uh, repel God's holiness. Right, this, the application is for we are to be holy, but these are three ways where in, we as individuals, perhaps uh, you do these as well as, as I do at, at certain times, where we repel God's holiness. The, the first one is secularization. Secularization is the process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations were considered to have lost their social significance. Secularization is like a way where you live a, live a life or, an, or your organization or your family 
and you are extracting yourself away from religious ideas and uh, basically the sacred. And you're pulling yourself out of that and you're secularizing uh, this. And so uh, when in, in doing so, the church and the sacred have lost their significance. And the result of that is that you or the society has lost its sense of shame. Because when you don't have the sacred, what's there to be shameful about? I can, I can parade around with my clothes off. I can, I can do this. I can do that. Because I have secularized myself from the sacred. I have secularized myself from God. And so that's the first way where we try to repel against God's holiness. A second way where we do this is in plural, pluralization. Pluralization. Different than diversity. I think we as Americans, we embrace and we love our diversity and, and uh, cultures. But this is a way where in pluralization, where it is whether, a, whether, it's a, where there is a competing number of worldviews available to its members and no worldview is, do, is dominant, it's, this leads to relativism. So when you have pluralization and there's no worldview that's dominant, you can argue yourself out of anything. You can point here and point there and, and, and I do this. And, and if you, you can justify your, any kind of actions that you have because we live in a pluralistic society where all worldviews are held at a very similar authority. You see this happening when there's organizations that are being flattened where the sacred is dismissed and organizations or families are flattened. You see the uh, demasculization of family. You see, the, you see that there's more uh, authority in the world and there's, there's, there's competing worldviews across uh, in this pluralization type of, type, of, type of society. So that's the second way where we try to repel God's holiness. First one is secularization and then pluralization. Pluralization, this results in no reason and irrationality. Where we live in a place where there's no reason and there's irrationality when there's pluralization and no dominant worldview above that provides answers to life's problems. The third way is pri privatization. Privatization. Now, I'm more of an introvert myself. This is a more of a temptation for me uh, to be able to want to be able to live a life that is uh, private, uh, and to, but to even make it a, a uh, privatization where it can, it can go against the, the mandate that we talked about last week in Genesis 1, where we are to, uh, for man to fill the earth and subdue it, is to, to go out and to get in the world. And so privatization is keeping your, your deepest responses to the most important things in life personal. The deepest responses to the most important things in life personal. And the result of this, uh, the result of privatization is a breakdown of meaning and there's nothing that is sacred. And so you can live a life that is private, and then when you go out, anything, anything goes. So you kind of see how these, in these three ways where we were, we are tendency uh, to be able to repel God's, God's holiness. So we should not forget the face of God. We should live our life, uh, the Latin phrase is corum Deo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Corum Deo. And... Um, we are to live a life as God in all his holiness and all his sacred is right there or, or he's imminent. And not only is that like a, like a what if, but he is. And that's when we go back to the truth of his incommunicable attributes where that separates him from mankind is that he is imminent and that he is right there in whatever you and I may be doing. And so this, is, this often um, naturally repels uh, us from, that we want to we do away with God. We, want, we don't want to do anything with God. We want God to be out, out the door. I want to live my life. I want to agree with whoever I want to agree with. So flip over on the back in Deuteronomy. And hopefully after that setup, these verses here will, will hit home for, for you as it has done for me. In Deuteronomy 32, verses 4 through 6, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. 
God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not your it is not be is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? So we when we are um, when we sin and we break this agreement, we are God is still our originator. He is still the one. He is still our creator. Uh, but we're going to get into what this means uh, when we do uh, violate. And so that's going to be in uh, a couple of sections from now. Section 3, let me read section 3. And um, it says, God is the father of all men in that he sustains, governs, cares for, and loves all men. God is the father of all men in that he sustains, g- governs, cares for, and loves all men. God as Father underlines his preservation and providence. I love these next couple of verses, these next couple of verses coming from Matthew, because in Matthew, Matthew wrote his gospel to the Jews. And when you look at the Old Testament with the Jews had their Bible in Jesus' time, uh, nowhere in the Old Testament do you see the Jewish people refer to God in the name, the name of God as Father. And so, in the, so these, these uh, verses in Matthew stick out tremendously. It would have spoke volumes that Matthew, uh, what are, when it, the gospel addressing to the Jews, how it was uh, very uh, to the point, and it was, it was often considered by the Jewish when, they, when Jesus referred to God as Father, it was, it was borderline, if not blasphemous. Uh, it was too casual, right, for it to be used in the name. And so, anyway, that, that's another thing. But these um, verses in Matthew here on the front, read with me Matthew 6, verse 26, where Jesus was saying, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into, into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And then in Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. God is not a watchmaker, stoic, uh, sitting upstairs, God. He is imminent. He is close by. He is interactive uh, with his creation. And it says so here in that he, that he takes care of them. He uh, sustains them. And um, Jesus is pointing out that he's taking care of his creation. So, so how much more value would he take care of you? This love described here in these verses is in a natural sense. It's in a natural sense as a universal action. Getting back to that word universal we have at the top, this is kind of like still under that category. Where the rain, the rain that God sends falls on the just and the unjust. All people born into this world are breathing God's air or drinking God's water and eating God's food, etc. This is, we are in our Father's world, are we not? So the application for this is for number, uh, number three. Depend on God as he is a perfect father. Depend on God as he is the perfect father. I'll give you another example of that uh, personal uh, yeah, I was in I was in the army, and when we were training, we would uh, when I was just learning as you know like a cadet, uh, I had upperclassmen uh, who were who were training alongside with me, and sometimes they would they would they would show by example how to advance on an objective, and so me I, you know not knowing anything, I just came from running cross country in high school, 
and I'm here like, you know, in my younger 20s trying to learn how to shoot a rifle and all these kinds of things about advancing and bounding and switching your selector level from safe to semi. Well, whenever I had an upperclassman who I trusted and who I knew cared for me, I would follow him wherever he went. And I would almost like, you know, want to use him as like a human shield. <laughs> I would be that close by as I'm watching him and I'm looking at everything that he's doing. I want to do the same thing. And I want to be right behind him so the bullets will go, will hit him first before it goes to me. And so there was this utter dependence, this utter dependence as a young soldier that I would have uh, with someone who is technically and competently uh, sound and the, and the ways of staying alive and fighting as a soldier. And so that's, this is kind of what it is in a spiritual sense, is it not? That when we go into uh, this world, uh, who better to follow uh, than God? Where we keep going back to his attributes and we keep being reinforced to, to who God is and that we must depend on him uh, because he cares for us. The enemy is prowling around and seeking for us to devour. And so uh, we need to be depending on, on God. Section four is God's fatherhood of all men is evidenced by his fatherly treatment of all men and his universal claim. First blank is universal claim. By his fatherly treatment of all men and his universal claim on men for phile uh, phileal Love and trust. Another word for Leah, I believe, is family. Love and trust is those next words. So universal claim and love and trust are, are the blanks. So the last sentence is, God as Father underlines the history of the fall of man and qualifies the doctrine of sin. So this kind of starts the transition that we have from the universal to the particular. This kind of goes uh, where there's this universal claim uh, where a, you, could say, you, could, you could say like a circle of trust is now being defined in this relationship. Uh, that if, when you're uh, in the circle, it is a particular. Uh, when you're outside the circle, you're still universally God's. Like he, he owns you. He, he, he has his uh, universal ruling authority uh, that, is, that, is, um, that is over you. And so I want you to understand this concept of like of the circle of trust in the concept of family. And biblically, we see this relationship uh, very well explained in the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. That it is when, and we're not going to spend the time uh, reading that, but just make a note there in Luke 15. I know it's uh, one of my wife's uh, favorite, favorite passages. And it was the son who left the father, was it not? Remember that? So, so it is that with you and me who break God's law, it is like we would be the prodigal son that have, that have left that. And what's amazing about this truth here that we're studying here is that even while the prodigal son has left, this is outside of what the parable is saying, but the truth in this section here is that even while the prodigal son is, is gone, the father is taking care of his own son. Uh, that's the power of God in that. In that. And this, that's for universal claim that God has made to all men in this, in this uh, thing. But there's also where we've got to be careful is that there is this uh, circle of trust that has been broken. And so there's, a, there's another sense where, where we have our relationship uh, changed. Because praise God for his goodness, but we are cursed because of his goodness. Are we not? That's a, do you, do you uh, see that? Is that we often want to blame God, don't we? Even though we're the ones that left, we're going to turn back around and say, but, you know, God, you're, you're, you, you didn't do this to me or you didn't do that to me or wh whatever the case is, we're going to find some way to be able to try to get our authority on the same level as God and act like God and look to God, but we are cursed because of his goodness. And so we left God's circle of trust where now it presents this idea of salvation and where only God can redeem us. That's what the Bible was written for. The Bible was written for, if you have a definition when you're 
uh, and a really quick definition of the Bible, if someone asks you or whatever, uh, I like to say that it is God's plan of redemption for, for man. It is God's plan of redemption for man. The application for, for this fourth, fourth section is our fatherhood and accountability related. Our fatherhood and accountability related. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is one of the reasons why that societies have historically, uh, and I think maybe even just recently, have demasculized societies. It's because there is a, a decreasing amount of fathers out there that want to or even have any sort of worthy accountability of their families or uh, men to stand up and to be accountable for what goes on uh, in our churches or organizations. And so we want to find ways to deflect. Uh, we want to accept carelessness. We want to, you know, we want to be able to be around people who are fine with that for whatever reason. When I was at uh, West Point, I would often hear a, a saying when I was, especially when I was younger, but I would uh, kind of jokingly, half jokingly say, and it's an underclassman, uh, when, a, when a new cadet or, and I would say it sometimes, well, not really to a, to a, a younger enlisted soldier, but, a, but with, a, with a new cadet who was going to be commissioned as an officer, uh, where that new cadet would, would make a mistake or would uh, do something carelessly, I would say, you know what, you just killed your platoon. Right? And so it was kind of like a, um, became like a, almost like a running joke because that wanted to be like rung in, in our head as, as training, as we are being trained to be uh, accountable as leaders, that when we make mistakes and that when we make as leaders, uh, that it has consequences, right? And so I, this uh, question here is, are fatherhood and accountability related? Absolutely. Absolutely. Fatherhood, whether you like it or not, you are a spiritual leader of your family, right? And so when a, like uh, for me, when I was a platoon leader, when a soldier broke regulations as a ranking officer for this soldier, I was obligated to respond. And if I didn't respond, there would be consequences, right? What? If a soldier broke regulations, well, there won't be too long where a second soldier is going to break reg regulations, and so on and so forth. But uh, those, those kind of reasons wouldn't be carried out and enforced uh, just for the sake of not spreading, but it was just the right thing to do, right? And so that's one of the things that uh, we pride ourselves in a cadet prayer. They, they say that uh, we uh, pray to, to do the harder right instead of the easier wrong. And that's, that's often when it is, is done, right? So we as fathers, I have a, uh, all the respect in the world uh, for fathers. And uh, we, we, we try to nurture them here at our, at our, at our, at our church. And we come around our, our, our fathers. And we, we, we uh, try to elevate and provide resources. And come around and to en en encourage, e e e uh, encourage one another in that. So when it comes to this accountability as fatherhood and our relationship with God, flip over on the back. And we get back to Acts 17. In Acts 17, if you look under on the top right of your sheet, I'm going to continue reading verses 29 through 31. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so Paul is in essence just bringing back this original concept, right? Where all men are accountable to God. And so it's not like this, this separation, but we are his creatures. And so... Uh, God uh, commands, you know, it's not an invitation, right? Can you imagine, like, as a platoon leader, like, I would in, invite, some, invite a young soldier, be like, you know, if, if, uh, would, you, would you please uh, follow uh, Article 1 plus, you know, 2B or whatever? 
Uh, no, th these are commands, right? That, uh, that's a ranking authority officer. Uh, and how, how much more important is God and his authority that he commands us to repent? And repent uh, is to be able to turn, to turn away from your sin and turn to him. So if you get back to repentance, it's like if you were the daughter company and you made an agreement with, uh, with, a, with another company outside the approval of the holding company, it is, it is cutting off, turning away from that daughter company and, and coming back to God, to that parent company, and, and shielding out, turning away all other agreements from any other companies except the parent company. Does that make sense? It's, it's very simple, right? This is not, this is not like rocket science, right? It's, it's, uh, but it's, it's very enlightening, is it not? when we think about how simple it is to be able uh, to be a child of God. And so in, in this respect, when we talk about uh, God and he is accountable for his creation, he is not a careless, careless God. He came down hard on his own son. Like Vodi says, Vodi Bachman, he says, and he's, uh, God, like God came down on his own son and, he's on, and, he, and you think, yeah, you're gonna, that he's going to let you slide. So when we think about that, it is, it is very simple, but it's very extreme. It is very extreme. Our destination is either going to be extremely good, or our destination is going to be extremely bad. Very, very urgently uh, important truth to be able to get, to get this understanding of our relationship with, with, with God here. Section 5, flip back over on the back. All men are, and this is where it gets into the particular, all men are sons of God only in this natural sense. All men are not, the first blank, not, all men are not truly sons of God in the spiritual sense. Second blank is spiritual. All men are not truly sons of God in the spiritual sense. God is naturally the father of all men as creator. God is spiritually and morally the father only of those who have been united with his son through faith by the Holy Spirit. The natural fatherhood of God prepares, and the blank is there, pre prepares. The natural fatherhood of God prepares the way for God's special fatherhood toward all who are in Christ. God as Father underlines union with Christ. So the reason, like we said here, that the reason for distinguishing these two, universal and particularly, uh, is very important. In our culture, God's grace is so great and widespread that we often don't even see the difference. You know, at point blank in our natural sense, uh, God's, God's wonder and his splendor uh, the things that we're able to enjoy here in our, in our culture and in, in this great United States, uh, we, we see the greatness of God. We have a history where we can go back to where uh, the Puritans and the, the Mayflower, I mean, we just have so much to be blessed by that we have a part of this heritage in our culture uh, where we do see the greatness of, of God. But we often, though, see the exact opposite when we see the wicked prosper and the righteous suffering, right? So in one sense, we can see the greatness of God. In another sense, we, can, we, we're like, we, we see the exact opposite. And we don't have time to read it, but in Psalm 73, that is the heart of the psalmist. It will, if you are, feel like you're uh, being isolated for your righteousness, uh, and you see others around you who are prospering, who are blatantly Disobeying God's law, Psalm 73 is a psalm for you. I often refer to that sometimes. Um, when we were reading the Psalms and the Proverbs, my perspective on the biblical wisdom parts of, of literature, I've often kind of read through those pretty quickly. Uh, recently, in recent years, I see now myself originally part of the wicked. And I see uh, that the righteous is only uh, uh, Christ. And anything that comes uh, from righteousness comes from Christ. And so when it's very convicting, you know, 
not, not many people are trained when you're reading the Bible uh, to be able to read it and you always, 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 right? Do you not think, of, think the other person is the wicked? No matter, no matter what you're doing, you're the other person is the wicked and I'm always the righteous person, right? Um, I would challenge you to read it the other way. And when you're looking at the righteous, think about Christ when you're reading those. Other, um, the, on the front there, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, where we see this, listen to these words here. When you read this again, I know we've, we just heard it preached uh, a, few, a few Sundays ago, uh, but the phrase is sons of disobedience and children of wrath in this particular part of theology. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. That is heavy, isn't it? We all once were. And if you have not come to Christ, you still are. And that is, uh, the, that is the truth. And so when we think about the truth here, that if, especially if you still are, if you're still thinking about uh, this God thing, uh, is, this, is this for me? Um, this application question will... Uh, pray that it'll, that, it'll, that it will help you out. How are children of wrath redeemed? How are children of wrath redeemed? The word redeemed means to be bought back. When you're in the grocery store, how many times do you see something on the shelf uh, jump out and get into your cart by itself? You don't see that. You don't, you don't, you don't see that. It takes... It takes, the, it takes the purchaser to grab it and the intention of buying it back, buying it. So the, 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 the concept of redeeming. And so that, that's a, it's a very simple concept, but we, we, a lot of us don't understand what it means to be redeemed, that we have been bought back, that God has redeemed us as a child of wrath. And in the... And all the heinous of that wrath that we, um, that, we, that we store up in our hearts, that God bought us back. And he didn't buy us back to but just writing a check. It cost him his son. It cost him his only son to go after the lost. And that's why Jesus came, was to uh, seek and to save that who was lost. And he didn't have to, but he poured out his wrath on him. He poured out his wrath on his own son. And knowing that truth, I'd like to continue in Ephesians on the, on the back. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse starting with, is it on the back? No, wait. Yeah, it's on the, uh, towards, the, towards the bottom. Ephesians 2, starting with verse 4, and these are the most wonderful uh, two words. Knowing all that about we are children of wrath, and uh, reading reading this with with a question in mind, how are the children of wrath redeemed? But Caleb was so great. No, 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 no. But God, but God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we, when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift, it is the gift of God, 
not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That speaks for itself. If you want any more of that, we have a couple sermons <laughs> talks about that. Um, section six here, look back on your front. Um, uh, read with me in uh, section six. God's fatherhood makes incarnation possible. Now read, read that really, again, a little slower. God's fatherhood makes incarnation possible. This isn't God makes atonement possible, right? Um, this is the incarnation. We have other words to describe uh, the, the atonement here in this, in this section here. God's fatherhood makes incarnation possible. For this implies openness, or I'm sorry, for this implies oneness of nature between God and man. The atoning death of Christ, I'm sorry, that first blank is nature. The atoning death of Christ could only be effective upon the ground of a common nature in Christ and humanity. Even the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit is intelligible only to the restoration of a filial relation or family relation, which was native to man, but which sin had disrupted. And in the last sentence, God as Father underlines the history of his redemptive work. So this basically means that we would not be able to be saved if Jesus the Christ was not the God-man. Right? There was a very unique and only way for, for God to provide salvation. It was only by his son. It was, the only way for us to be saved is if the son of God became man. Where he was truly God, truly man, fully God, fully man. I think that means the same thing if you define him in the, in the, in the, right, in the right way. But it is, is absolutely critical for this. And so we see other, other religions uh, lead, lead, us, uh, lead, lead others astray uh, by saying that Jesus uh, was just a man, he wasn't God, and all these types of things. Uh, no, for, for the atoning death of Christ could only be effective if there was a union of the incarnation, of God coming in the flesh. And this is, this is uh, very well, I'm so, so happy and, and, and joyful that we as a culture still celebrate Christmas and that we still uh, honor the incarnation. Uh, what, 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 a, what a wonderful thing that this is to be able to, uh, to uh, do this. To help us understand this, I want to turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read several, several verses here, and they're going to, God's word is going to speak for itself here. I'm not going to, uh, we'll spend a few more minutes after this, but in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, I'm going to be starting in verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. Let me read that again. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. You see the, I'm going to pause here for a second. Do you see the uniqueness and the critical nature of Christ because of the Son of God coming from the Father? Uh, there had to be someone that comes from the Trinity. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name, your name being God, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, here's the position of Christ, and the next one is the position of those in Christ. 
in verse 13. And again, I, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, there's, there's so much jam-packed in there, but we're just going to continue reading. Um, verse 14, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Amen? I could read that verse over and over again. It is the power of Christ that overcame death. Verse 15, And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. It's another example of total depravity. If you're looking around there, uh, that, that, all, that people are subject to slavery when they're, when they're born, like, th- like their whole life. That we have been subject, we are, we are children of wrath. We're subject to slavery all their lives. Verse 16, for assuredly, he does not give up to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He is he is God and he overcame death. 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your sting? In the passage here, in, uh, you see on the front, Romans 8, it reads, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous re- requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can flip over to Romans 8, because the point here in these in verses 3 through 4 in Romans 8, the word condemned screams at the reader, is that we know Romans 8, verse 1, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And then in verse 3 here, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so this, this demands an either or for our, are we going to be eternally saved or are we not? Thanks be to God for his qualified atonement where the sacrifice could only be the God man. And the application for this last part is how can you reconcile others to God? How can you reconcile others to God? Uh, My simple uh, simple definition of the word reconcile is to to make right, is to make right. And two people cannot reconcile if there is not an intermediary absolute. You're either going to reconcile to one the one or the other one is going to reconcile to the other. There needs to be a, an absolute intermediary in order to make things right. And what more as an intermediary absolute than Christ and be the name of Christ. And so when we read here in, um, flip over on the back, the last, the last, uh, the last verse here, in 2 Corinthians 5, 5.18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I understand reconciliation because I, I often use it at work when I run weekly reports, 
And we have to reconcile our weekly reports to our monthly reports. Our monthly reports is what's reported to the cor corporation, and the, and the monthly reports is what is absolute. And so what, is, what could have errors and what could have uh, missed the mark uh, gets reconciled uh, to what is absolute. And so we, are, we cannot reconcile on our own, reconcile our, 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 we cannot reconcile ourselves apart from God's work in us. And so he reconciles us, he, by redeeming us, by him pulling us off the shelf, putting us in the circle of trust, and now we are in this particular uh, arrangement uh, of an unconditional covenant, the new covenant that, uh, that, 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 that God has made uh, through Christ. And so how can we reconcile others is this, for one, you must understand the message of reconciliation, and then two, uh, to go out and to, and to, and, and to, uh, and, and to go. And so the, to, to proclaim, to continue in God's word as our, uh, the end of our Next Steps book call, and I believe in uh, John 8.31 is the verse, uh, talks about to, con to continue in his word. And so this, this means to be able to preach Christ crucified, uh, to stay true to the scriptures. And when you, when you do that, you are going to reveal in others how they are off. And that, that means pointing out sin. Because you can't, you can't call someone out and to be reconciled if they're not reconciled. Like, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, think, of like a, think of like a bullseye target. Um, in order to get right with God and into that bullseye, you need to point out, hey, you're off the target. Or you're a couple off. Hey, let me come around you. And you know, there, there's a ministry there of reconciliation uh, where those who are in Christ, those who are on target, uh, need to go out and wrap around those who are not reconciled and to bring them to Christ. And so we can do that in a way that is loving, in a way that the application of, the, of section one of uh, being a witness of who God is, uh, making him known uh, to others and, and, and all of that. We need to call, call others uh, to look up to Christ, to believe in him as their Lord and their Savior. That he accomplished the work required to get back to God, to get, to get back to uh, his, fam his original intended family, the circle of trust to be reconciled. So uh, pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this time. And I, I do pray that there's an understanding here. I know in our, in our culture, it is, this is one of the most uh, misunderstood. Uh, we have been a fallible, uh, fallible people. We have gone astray. And it is difficult for us to look around and to see others who are reconciled. We look around and there is a vast amount of people who are not reconciled and who are not in, in Christ. They are not in your, in your uh, redeemed, uh, re regenerated church. And we're, so help us to be able to go out and to be able to minister uh, in this reconciliation that you call us to be able to do. But dear Lord, we do help you uh, to help us uh, we ask for you to help us uh, when we go out and we see the wicked prospering, that you would give uh, each and every one of us a sense of blessing and joy of your salvation that you have given to us. We uh, do praise your name as we look around here in this church, and we are encouraged by those who are reconciled. And what an encouragement it is to be able to be around uh, just um, such a redeemed uh, people here at Beulah Baptist. And uh, just continue to be with us, be with us tonight, and uh, and as we move forward in Jesus' name, Amen.